Good evening, I'm Sarita Godber, Director of People and Culture at the Science Museum Group, and I'm delighted to welcome to this very special event, live streamed from the Smith Centre at the Science Museum in London, Chief Executive of the Science Museum Group, Sir Ian Blatchford, in conversation with the CEO of Christian Aid, Amanda Cozy Mokwashi. This event is part of the Science Museum Group's open talk series of online events, which aims to examine the causes and effects of inequality and discrimination based on ethnicity, gender, sexuality and disability within the sphere of STEM, science, technology, engineering and mathematics, and in wider society. So far, we've, we've celebrated women in medicine with the Guilty Feminist podcast, examined the racial prejudices embedded in everyday technology. And Sir Ian has been joined in conversation by MPs David Lammy and Chris Bryant to explore issues around race and homophobia. And we'll have more events in this series uh, announced later this year. Tonight, however, we focus on the theme of identity, as Sir Ian is joined by Amanda Cozy Mukwashi, CEO of Christian Aid and the author of but Where Are You Really From? It's a fascinating book which explores issues of race and culture and how it feels to be judged on skin colour when identity is made up of so many things. You can purchase a copy of this brilliant book by following the link in the description below. So all that remains to be said is thank you for joining us for this discussion on a deeply important issue. And now I'd like to hand over to Sir Ian and Amanda. Well, Sarita, thank you, and welcome to our audience watching online. And we really are live in the Smith Centre, and I'm with a real human being. So, Amanda, welcome to the Science Museum. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, we're here to discuss your book. Yes. Um, uh, and I'm very keen, uh, dear audience, that actually, although I will give you a flavour of the book, this is a wonderful read, um, not only beautifully written, but I think it will give you so much to think about. And I, I wanted... Uh, to start by explaining how you came on my radar, because a lot of people are thinking, how on earth do these people know each other? And, and uh, we got to know each other because I was listening to a wonderful BBC Radio 4 programme, uh, the Sunday programme, which is on uh, the radio at seven in the morning on a Sunday. Um, fascinating people. And I heard you talk about your book. And uh, you were on for about 10 minutes. And afterwards, I thought, I wanted so much more. In 10 minutes. I had a sense that there was so much more that you, you, you could give uh, in the book. And um, given that um, I encountered you through a religious affairs program, I wanted to start with something you said to me when we were talking before uh, going live this evening, uh, because the book is obviously about your life story and about identity. But I was very struck by uh, a comment that Rowan Williams made when he interviewed you first about the book, which is that Although it's your life story, it's not really about Amanda, that actually what you're seeking are some universal truths and some ways forward in a very contested world. So let me start with an amazing thing you said to me. We both watched Prince Philip's funeral. Yes, we did. And there was a wonderful moment when the coffin appeared with his royal standard. And tell me what struck you about that. I was saying that what really struck me was the fact that um, I think when they, they were explain, the journalist was explaining uh, the standard, that it was made up of four quadrants that represented different p parts of, uh, of his heritage, of uh, Prince Philip's her heritage. So I think there was one which was Scotland, I think there was another one which was Danish, and I think there was another one that was Mount Button or something like that, and I can't remember the fourth one. But I was really struck by the fact that, you know, he was in, as he was leaving this world, he was celebrating that multiple heritage that he had. And um, yeah, which was beautiful really, because I think many of us have got multiple heritage. We're not just one thing and one thing alone. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, uh, what a wonderful, uh, the whole service actually was a celebration of an, uh, a particular sense of Britishness, but also the complexity of that as a nation, where well, the British are, of course, uh, by origin, very complex. But um, t turning to the book, I mean, the obvious question I have to ask you, first of all, is what prompted you to write it? Wow. Um, I think several things, but I think uh, the sort of one defining thing was uh, the death of my grandmother. 
and um, she had been the matriarch of the family and uh, uh, larger than life, uh, as, as, as one might say. And um, she used to tell us stories about um, how uh, she traveled from Zimbabwe. They used to tell us stories about their history. The fa she, she seemed to be the repository of knowledge for the whole family. And I, I remember saying to my sister that, you know, with her gone, um, we had lost quite a lot. And I just wanted to start talking about it and putting it in writing. And, and of course, while, when the idea started, I thought I would be writing specifically just about about her and about my, my family. But when I started writing, slowly the idea evolved into a story of uh, humankind rather than a story of just Amanda. And uh, the thing that I loved about your book is um, having discovered you on the radio and thinking, I hope I enjoy this book. And, and of course I loved it because it's very difficult to categorize. Um, I mean, uh, when you were on the BBC, it was described as an exploration of identity, but it's about so many things. And the other thing that's very striking, and I just wonder whether you're aware of it, is that I, I interview a lot of people, and they tend to be politicians and journalists, and they write in a very particular way. And their style is that they have, they're not troubled by doubt, mm -hmm. okay? That actually they're very certain that their prescription in the book. Your style is completely different. It has a very quiet confidence about it. And I wondered, were you aware of that as you were writing? What did you learn about yourself as you were expressing yourself on a page? You know, I, I, you know how you start writing? You start writing and sometimes you write one page, you scrap it, start again. And um, it was only when I decided to write in my own voice that I found it easy to go from page one to page two to page three and so on. And um, I write the way I speak. Um, I wanted to be authentic to who I am. I wanted to be authentic also to my feelings and uh, my worldview. And also I think um, the multiplicity of experiences because it's not, my life hasn't been linear and I don't think that there's anybody's life that has been just straight. I think, you know, there's so many things, uh, so many experiences that you have. And, um, and so in the book, I wanted to express that. But I also didn't want it to be exclusive. I wanted anybody to be able to pick up the book and read it. I think that, you know, um, a 15 year old can pick up the book and read it. I'm hoping that a 10 year old can pick up the book and read it. I'm hoping that a professor at the university can pick it up and read it. And that all of them, um, there's going to be something that resonates with them and sort of touches uh, who they are. So, but uh, really I think um, I wanted my voice. Um, so I speak and I write as I speak. Well, I think um, I'm going to, uh, uh, as we uh, have our conversation, try and quote parts of the book to you because you do have a very distinctive voice. I, I was just uh, thinking earlier about some of the phrases you use, which I might come back to later, where you, you provoke the reader to think, what does she mean? And think, so you talk about conscious brokenness, you talk about soil erosion. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that the great strength of the book is actually, is, is, is two things. One is it's universal themes, but also you, it's wonderfully surprising if you're a reader. So although Britain and Zambia feature very heavily, suddenly we find you're in Rome, and then you're in Ethiopia, and then you're in Coventry, um, and it keeps the reader alert. Um, of course, the central question that I want to ask you is, uh, the book has a provocative title, um, and I think many of us, when we look at the title, are thinking of occasions when we might ourselves have asked that question, yes. not realising its impact on people. Um, and just tell me, what is, the, what is the core thing that troubles you about the question? Because you talk in the book about trying to move from that question mm -hmm. to a more interesting one that you say is, who are you? Mm -hmm. So tell me more about the, the core message. I'll tell you something, um, Ian. I think uh, it doesn't feature in the book, but um, in, in, in preparing to come here and have this conversation with you, I started thinking about it. And I remember once, um, this was in Coventry, uh, there was an Asian colleague um, that I was, who I was working with. And I remember asking her, where are you from? 
I just... <laughs> yes. Fantastic. Well, it gets better okay, or it gets worse. Um, I said, where are you from? And she said, I'm from Kenya. And I looked at her and uh, she, was, she, she was of Asian heritage. And I said, no, 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 no. But where are you really from? Yeah. Right? And, and she got upset. She got upset and she said, I said, I'm from Kenya. You know, what makes you think I'm not from Kenya? Fast forward, I'm writing this book. And I think um, some of that sort of core message is really about um, take me at my word. All right. And um, there is no one single definition about how people who come from Zambia look like or how people who come from England look like or the United Kingdom look like. Um, we're all very different. I mean, if you look at Africa now, you can't say that an African is black uh, with short hair. No, yeah. I mean, they come in all shapes, forms and sizes and all colors, right? I think it's the same even within the United Kingdom. So that question really about, um, it's not so much the first question of where are you from, it's um, the refusal to accept that accept first answer. Accept the answer. Yes. And I was very struck by something that um, you said in a, in a conversation with Rowan Williams, who of course is mm -hmm. um, chair of Christian Aid, yeah. uh, which I thought was very perceptive of him, which is that when a white person here asks mm -hmm. another white person that question, what they're often seeking is common ground, yes. common interests, you know, you know, the British are like for, you know, pastimes and sport and a whole range of things, whereas actually what the book seems to be saying is that the, the, the refusal to accept the answer is seeking difference rather than common ground. Is that, is that the thing that troubles you about the question? Yes, yes, because I think, uh, in fact, I think it goes beyond just the refusal of finding common ground. Um, it's a refusal of who you are, yeah. right? Um, and we see this permeating in so many different ways um, that, um, you know, as, 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 a, as a black woman or as a black person, right? Mm. There's so many parts of me that are erased from, more, from the picture, you know? Um, there was a picture of, um, uh, uh, I think the activists, Greta and Vanessa, do you remember that picture, yeah. right? Where there were four of them and Vanessa from Uganda was the only black girl there. But she's, she's an activist. Yeah. But what came out in the media was a picture of the three uh, white young oh, people. Oh yes, and in fact they were photoshopped yeah. and she disappeared from some Absolutely. images. Absolutely. Yes. So, you know, and, and that is, um, it permeates through so many different aspects of our lives that um, the refusal to acknowledge, to accept your initial answer is a refusal to acknowledge you. Yeah. And the fact that um, you might be part of, you know, you could say to me, I'm from Zambia. I should be able to say, oh, which part of Zambia? Yeah. And we take it from there. Right? Yeah. Rather than, no, 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 you, you can't really... Be. Not allowed. You, yes, you're not allowed. <laughs> People like you uh, are not from Zambia, and therefore you must be from somewhere else. That's essentially what I'm saying. Yes. Right? And I think what's also fascinating, in the, in the section of the book where you talk about that, um, there's a very striking quote which resonates with me, because you'll be aware there's a very... Um, you know, I run this major museum and used to chair a body that represents uh, all the major museums in the UK. And this huge um, discussion about contested heritage, although I re prefer to call it shared, mm -hmm. and, and in this big battle about, you know, the stories and legacy of, em of empire. But can I quote you, back at you, because I think this is such a quietly thoughtful comment. You say, for too long, stories have been told by the few and the world has been shaped around their untruths, half-truths, and single perspectives. The next phase of their journey must be based on different stories and new truths. I mean, how could any unreasonable person actually disagree with that? But actually, that's of a profound importance, that sense of different perspectives for you. It is. For me, it is. Because um, when there's one view of the world or of the truth, Right? And if that view says that you are subhuman, then um, it's a story really that is not complete. Right? So for that story to be complete, um, you need to hear the different truths. That I'm human, I look different. 
but actually the color of my skin um, is, is not important. It's not as important as that which makes us both human, right? Um, so small, small things that, uh, that we learn in history, for example, um, uh, uh, the, the Victoria Falls in Zambia, which I talk about uh, yeah. in my book. I love the place. Um, I think it's a beautiful place. And, um, you know, when, when you read history books, especially if, if you're reading them from here, from this part of the world, uh, the Victoria Falls was only discovered when David Livingstone went there. It wasn't. It was only discovered for the British people yeah. or for the Western world, for those of our ancestors who lived in that part of the world. It was not a new discovery, right? Yeah. And, and so it's all part of the same truth, yeah. right? But there isn't only one truth. And I think that's what I'm trying to say that um, even as we teach history or as we teach in our education systems, you know, we're in a museum here. It's a beautiful place, right? Um, we need to be able to have all the different parts of history, the different truths, so that we can have a holistic view and understanding of what it could have been. Actually, we are richer as a people when we look at these different facets. But that's the fascinating yeah. thing for me. I'm so interested you put it that way because in some of the conversations I have with politicians, these truths are in competition. My view is I don't understand the competition because actually many things can be true at once and enjoy that. Yeah. And can I ask you, um, I, mean, I mean, in the book, it's very interesting. Uh, when, um, uh, you know, the George Floyd uh, death happened and, and uh, there was a lot of media discussion around that, there was a lot of interesting material on the BBC and CNN website about uh, an interesting thing that you reflect on in your book which is that if you're a black man or woman who's been born in Africa, um, you don't kind of think about your skin color or your ethnicity. You might think about some tribal allegiances. Um, and it's very striking in the book that when you first came to Britain, mm -hmm. suddenly that disconcerting, strange experience where actually suddenly you're a social construct that actually you have to think about yourself differently because people are judging you in a way that is inconceivable when you're in Zambia. I think that was a difficult time for me, I have to say, because um, I think when you're, when you're in Zambia or when you're in different parts of Africa, you don't really talk about blackness. Uh, it you? just doesn't, doesn't come up. Uh, in fact, when I speak to my friends who are still living in different African countries, they find it strange that I spend so much time talking about the issue of blackness, right? But when I moved to this country, uh, that's what started defining who I was to everybody else around me, right? Um, in Zambia, I was, you know, the woman down the street or... Or someone's granddaughter. Or somebody's granddaughter yes. or somebody's sister. Here, I was, um, I was the, the black woman first and foremost, right? So, um, and uh, with that label comes all the baggage and the assumptions and the perceptions and misperceptions that are associated with it. So if I'm sitting on the train, uh, the first thing that you do when you look at me or the first thing that comes to your mind is she's a, she's a cleaner um, or she works on the bus or she, you know, she does manual jobs. Uh, I can't be anything that is above that, right? Because actually the issue of blackness comes with so many associated levels. Um, and most of them, I have to say, um, not always so good. No, no, sure. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you about role models because there's a lot in the book about and, and lots of different messages. Uh, one, thing, one thing in the book, I don't know whether you intended it to be funny, but I actually found it very amusing, is that other people, including black people, will make assumptions about the appropriate role models. And there's a very funny thing in the book where you say the people assume mm -hmm. that your life is inspired by people like Maya Angelou. Now, she's a wonderful writer, but, but actually it amused me because in fact in the book you say, well, actually you talk very beautifully in the book about your mothers and aunties. And there's a wonderful phrase that I thought was very moving. You describe them as your teachers, counselors and comforters. Say something about that because it, people assume that, you know, these other external figures, but actually your own family is what's yes. really made yeah. you who you are. I think so. And I think, I think if many people think about it, 
you will see that the, the, the people who make the biggest impressions on you are those that are in your family, whether positively or negatively, that those in your inner circle first. So um, I would go for training, for example, I would go for leadership development uh, courses. And one of the activities that you'd be asked to do is, can you list your role models? And, and if I put my mother there, they'll say, no, you know, can you put, list somebody who is, you know, out there in public? And I was thinking, yes, I mean, that brilliant, you know, like Maya Angelou, she is fantastic, you know. But on a day-to-day -day basis, the people that really supported me, the people that taught me the values that I have, um, the people who picked me up when I was down, you know, they're my mothers, my aunties, my grandmother, my friends. Um, and when I came to this country, of course, it was what I call the black sisterhood, sure. right? Well, oh, I'm um, coming on to that. I've got many questions on that subject. Okay, <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, um, so I, I don't think that we should feel guilty that when we are asked the question, who are your role models? that we name those people who are closest to us, especially when they've had such um, fantastic impact um, and influence on, uh, on the journey that That's we've taken. That's what I like about your, your, right. in the book where you talk about it, because in a way, a lot of the debate about role models becomes quite rigid, which is, the so it, in the same way that Maya Angelou is supposed to be your role model, mm -hmm. You know, supposedly maybe my role model is Nelson or Winston Churchill. Actually, it's not. It's my grandparents, by the way. But let me ask you another question about role models, which you mentioned in the BBC interview, which sent me off to do some research. You mentioned a very interesting report by Green Park, uh, a thing called The Colour of Power, mm -hmm. and um, which looks at the 1,100 most influential roles in Britain. Um, and actually, I, I remember the, the, the figures you quoted. So of that more than a thousand powerful jobs in Britain. 52 are from, uh, are from the BAME category and only 16 have um, black African heritage. Um, and your point I think is, uh, the reason I ask you uh, about it is that for say some of my younger colleagues, um, that resonates hugely. When you see people in various communities interviewed, the lack of diversity in powerful positions is a big issue. So although, um, you know, your, your family is a role model for you. I think my sense is for the younger generation, that lack of genuine diversity in leadership roles is becoming more and more embarrassing and calling into question some of the diversity rhetoric. Yes, yes. Well, I, I think that, um, yes, like you said, uh, your, you know, your family being your role models is really important and very powerful. But seeing other people who look like you um, is also important. In fact, it's very important. And um, it's, it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy because in a way we have created a, a world, a structure where that has become absolutely essential. Yeah. Right? Because you know that when you don't see people like you in those senior places, um, it speaks to a particular worldview, yeah. right? And that worldview is a worldview that says, we don't have enough black people you know, who are qualified, which is not true. You know, which is not true. Um, I certainly know that I work very hard, you know, um, and I know so many others who work twice as hard just to be counted half as good, <laughs> right? Um, and, and so why it is so significant for us to have um, a diverse group of people in leadership is an acknowledgement that we are all bringing different things to the table, right? And that um, it's not just the different skills, it's the different experiences, the different lived experiences, which we need um, to find solutions that are going to be good for all of us, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and because if we come with only one worldview, one type of lived experience to the table. What happens to everybody else that hasn't gone through that, that lived experience? Um, and so, you know, for me, I think that Green Park uh, report was, um, was, was really good, but it told me things that I could see with my own mm -hmm. eyes. Mm -hmm. I knew that. Um, and I also know that, you know, when, uh, when I, I can speak about, I can speak for myself as a black woman, mm. 
when you struggle so hard and you work so hard to get into those senior positions, um, the battle is not over. Because yeah. even when you're in that senior position, you then have to fight on a daily basis, right? Um, those microaggressions towards you, right? And at some point you sort of ask yourself, for how long can I do this? Yeah. I'm exhausted and I get out. And so you begin to see a lot of, you know, um, people of, from different backgrounds getting out of leadership, not because they want to, but because it's They've had just, enough. I've had enough. It's exhausting. But you use a very interesting phrase in the book, um, which is a, a thing that has never occurred to me, okay? You say that because you're a black woman running a major organization, you have to be perfect. And I was very struck by that phrase. So um, I have, you know, strengths and weaknesses, mm -hmm. and my weaknesses you know, my colleagues it either drives them mad or they find them charming, but it's just part of me. But is, you seem to be saying in the book that actually, if you're a woman leading an organisation, the scrutiny is exceptionally tough. Unfortunately, I think, we, um, I think it's like that. I think if you're a woman, um, there's a certain level of expectations from you as a, as a woman. Um, you are expected to understand um, gender equality uh, because um, you were born understanding gender equality. <laughs> yes. Um, sorry, I shouldn't. <laughs> I, I understand, shouldn't. Amanda, totally. Yeah. Um, but when you're a black woman, then you also carry the weight of, of, of the black struggle on your shoulders, right? Uh, so on the one hand, you have that. And on the other hand, um, the systems that be will judge you very harshly. So you don't get uh, to make a mistake uh, more than once. Yeah. So while I don't have to be perfect, I'm expected to be perfect, right? And the reality is that okay, I will never be perfect. So you're setting me up to fail, right? Because you expect me to be something that you can never be, right? There's no perfection. And uh, I'm sure you appreciate that as a, as a, as a, as a woman of faith, um, perfection is reserved for, yes, for, for the divine. Yes, for someone rather superior to us. <laughs> Perfect. Um, you referred earlier to um, the black sisterhood. And, and for me, um, strange enough, is a subject which I'm wholly uh, inexpert on. But actually, there's some powerful and beautiful writing in the book. And I want to quote a very striking passage when you talk about this if I may. It's quite a long Please. quote, but very important. The black African woman represents to me the struggles and the achievements, the vulnerabilities and the resilience, the injustices and the compassion that is reflected in the contradictions of the world at war with itself. That's quite a quote. Explain yeah. that to me. Where do I start? <laughs> um, so, you, you know, when you, when, we, when you think of black women, um, when you think of the images that we see of uh, black women in Africa, for example, uh, we always talk about them as being very poor, being very desperate. We talk about them as um, having no skills, destitute. Every single phrase that you can think of that, is, um, uh, that describes hopelessness is used to describe uh, this African woman. And yet at the same time, you know, it's the same African woman that um, is described as being resilient, as being, you know, being the mother, as being the, the wife, as being the, the producer. You know, you go into the fields in agriculture, she's in there. You know, this superwoman, right? Yeah. And, uh, and that's why, you know, when I look at those descriptions, I think to myself, um, they're not a contradiction as mm. such. Mm. They're a representation of our world. Yeah, oh, right? I see what you mean, okay. Yeah. Yes, they are a representation of our world. And um, uh, what is good uh, in that African woman, in that black woman, is that resilience that we all have as human beings when we do come together. But what is bad and ugly is uh, the mistreatment of each other, right? And so when you look at the fact that the, the African woman sits at the bottom of the food chain, mm -hmm. the exploitation uh, of African women. Right now we're talking about climate change, for yeah, example, yeah. right? I was in Ethiopia um, uh, visiting um, before the lockdown. I went on a Christian aid uh, visit 
and I met um, women in South Omo, which is in the south of, of Ethiopia. And you look at these women and they were saying to me, climate change is not um, some hypothetical debate for us. It's here. Yeah. You know, our livestock are dying, yeah. right? Our crops are not growing. We're not able to feed our children. And so we have to try and find other means, right? Um, they're paying the price, right, for somebody else's actions, mm -hmm. right? So uh, in this country, our development came as a partially as a result of uh, of the Industrial Revolution, oh. right? And uh, we have contributed so much to carbon emissions in the world. The, the Ethiopians haven't. Yeah. And yet they're having to leave the cost of, uh, of the impact and the consequences of, of, of climate change. And so that's, that's why, you know, when I, when I look at this African woman as a character, mm. I think to myself, she embodies what is beautiful about the humanity and what is ugly in terms of the greed that we see and the exploitation. And all that is played out in her. And that's why she is my, my role model. So I want to stay on the subject because um, I was reading the last annual report of Christian Aid and what's yeah. very striking is that some of the most innovative projects have women at the center um or, or one that really struck me because uh, it was so wonderful and, uh, and inspiring was women in malawi working mm -hmm. on solar projects mm -hmm. um and you know uh, uh, as the thing that i try and say to my colleagues is we have a very eurocentric view of uh, of energy but um tell me more about this so this so this is basically um, a country which has had huge challenges where, you know, the being connected to the grid is inconceivable for many people in rural communities. But these are women solving the problems themselves and finding their own solutions. Yes, yes. I think I, I, think I remember the, the programme you're talking about. Um, I visited Malawi. Uh, I'm from that part of the world. So um, it's a country that I know a little bit. I visited um, that particular community and um, uh, they, we, were, we were supporting them together with DFID at the time. It was a, I think it was a DFID funded project um, on solar powered irrigation systems. Okay. okay. Right. And um, so I met, I met quite a number of them and uh, they were showing me the, 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 their gardens, their vegetable gardens. As a, as a village, as a community, they had come together, they had this irrigation system, and they were using their own skills and uh, resources um, to become more resilient financially, yeah. right? And they showed me structures in terms of how they had prog progressed. So I met a, one specific woman, Agnes. Um, she said to me, um, this used to be my house. Uh, it was one roomed. But because of this project, um, you know, I am now making profit and I'm investing some of my money, but I now have a two bedroomed house that I have managed to build where my son, you know, can live comfortably yeah. with me and, and can go to school. And, and then after the cyclone, remember there was a cyclone yes, I died that happened? Yes. yes. Um, I couldn't go back and visit them. But, you know, I was able to see, because it was the same community that was impacted on. Mm. And uh, she was interviewed, I think, by one of our Christian Aid uh, staff. And she said, I'm able to bounce back because I was in a good place to yeah. begin with. Right? Yeah. And, and that's what we're really about. Right? Yeah, exactly. we are, yeah, we're about really supporting um, those communities. And for me, they inspire me because um, those are women defying the odds. So on that subject, um, and in my questions also, we've had questions from the public. Okay. Um, and here's, here's one, which I think follows on neatly from that. This is from someone called Josie. And here's her question. Uh, is there one experience or lesson that you have learned from the Black Sisterhood that you would, that you would pass on to the younger generation? No pressure. <laughs> think of what, what, what the answer. That's a tough question. Um, yes. I would say that you need them. You really need them. Um, because um, when, uh, when you don't know where to go for information, they're there. When you want to pick up um, the phone and just um, cry for, I don't know, a few minutes, they'll be there. Yeah. 
when you want somebody to help you, especially for those of us who are like Africans in the diaspora and we don't have large family, yeah. extended family here, sometimes you want somebody to, to be an aunt to your children. Okay. They're there. So they're not just there in one um, aspect of your life. They become your family. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay. They become yes. your family. And for me, when I came to the United Kingdom, when I was really struggling, they became the, my, my, my pillars, right? So when I needed training, when, it, when I wanted to understand how I could uh, better engage with the community here, those who had been here for a little while longer than me were able to see the path for you. They said, you know, this is what you do. Why don't you volunteer, Amanda? Yeah. You know, then you can learn about the community. Why don't you do this? And, um, and I think each one of us needs that. I think we need our support mechanism. And I guess that's, uh, uh, well, I'll stop there. But I think during the lockdown, we have struggled as human beings because some of that has... That natural support network just has, has yeah. Yes, has fallen away. Um, and, and for me, the Black Sisterhood had to have a mention in my book yeah. because they helped me, if I look at three big things, in terms of my career, in terms of my children, yeah. and then in terms of my, just my emotional and mental well-being, mm -hmm. which was so important. Uh, they were there. And, you know, God knows that there were many, there were many tears. Yeah, of course. Like, um, but they were fantastic. So you also mentioned... A wonderful organisation in your book. I've been researching them quite a lot, and unfortunately, I'm not eligible to be part of this club. <laughs> this is Akina Mamawa Africa. Yes. Wow. Yes. Looking at some of the people on that yes. group, they sound pretty awesome. It sounds from the book as if this was, you were quite tentative about approaching them at first, I think, yes. Yes. Um, which I thought was quite interesting. But it sounds to me as if, if you want to say something about this mm. group, and it sounds like it was quite transformational encountering them. It was. I mean, Akira Mama were Africa. They're now based, uh, they've got their HQ in, in Uganda. They used to be here in London. Um, it, was, uh, it was a group of African women standing in solidarity with each other and refusing to, to be kept down. Okay. Okay. And um, I remember that uh, at one point, the, the funding um, that, that we were asking for to do some of the work that we did, because we, uh, we worked with the Af African women and, and mental health uh, and issues of domestic violence, but we also did African women's leadership. And at one point, it was a struggle to get funding for the African women's leadership part, because um, how dare you talk about African women and leadership in the same <laughs> sentence, you know. Yeah, mustn't you know, be allowed. Of course Where not. will it lead? You know, no I, mean, I mean, <laughs> yes, let's talk about African women and domestic violence. Yeah. Let's talk about African women and mental health, but not as, you know, in terms of leadership. And this group of women uh, refused to let that go. And uh, so many of us have passed, have walked through Akinamama or Africa and... Uh, it's, um, it continues to this day, and, um, and for me, I just thought to myself, what a wonderful... Uh, I, d I did find their website so inspiring. I'm, I would say now, with yeah. witnesses to my colleagues, that I'd love the Science Museum to know them better, because the other thing that's very striking is that, um, obviously, unavoidably, I look at Africa with mm -hmm. a European eye, mm -hmm. and so what I see is many countries, many languages, many regimes, and, and on the face of it, you think, well, how can this group have common ground on leadership until you look at the case studies? Mm -hmm. And it seems to be one of the abiding themes in your book is whilst we endlessly seek difference, yes. why don't we actually turn it around the other way and find some common ground? And, and, and the, the leadership uh, sections on the website, I thought were extraordinary. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are 54 countries in Africa, on yeah. the African continent, um, over 1.2 billion people. Mm. You know, we speak so many different languages, so many different cultures. Uh, as long as we continue to focus on the differences, yes. right? Um, we are not going to find the, 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 the gold, or, yeah. you know, that exists in our, in our shared common agendas, mm. right? 
And, um, and I think in terms of leadership, what we did, what Akina Mama did was to say, you know, um, we, we are worthy. You know, we deserve to be heard. We want to be heard. We have a voice. You know, allow us to speak for ourselves. We can step into that space, right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, then, and then we did. Right. Wonderful. So um, I, I, think, I think that it's a, it's a, it's a very good organization. Yeah. And uh, at its very core is uh, African women standing in solidarity. That's what Akina Mama Africa means. Yeah, great. No, I mean, that was a real, real discovery, mm. uh, thanks to your book. Um, I want to slightly, well, stay, actually stay on the subject of leadership okay. and, and really speak to you as one chief executive uh -huh. to another, because we know being chief executive is a veil of tears and joy as well, Absolutely. depending on which day yes. you ask. And I just wondered, one of the things that um, every person I know who's a chief executive, no matter what type of organisation, is wrestling with a kind of paradox, and I wonder how you deal with it which is on the one hand, you want to hear all the voices of your colleagues and in my organization and yours, uh, we're surrounded by very intelligent, passionate people. But in the end, whilst you want to be inclusive, you do have to make decisions. And I wonder, I, I wonder whether the expectations of some perfect unity are greater on you because it's Christian aid. But I mean, how do you deal with that? Because you know, you've had a very tough year, I imagine, like everyone else. I mean, uh, you've closed some of you UK offices, you've had to withdraw from some of your territories overseas. I mean, how can you be inclusive and also decisive? Wow, um, tough question, but um, I think um, several approaches that I take um, that when uh, that one, I need to be inclusive because I need to l hear the different voices. Um, you don't always get it perfectly well, but uh, but you try. And I think coming from an, uh, an ethnic minority and n understanding and knowing firsthand just how important it is to be heard, then what you try to do, at least what I try to do, is to create spaces where people can be heard, right? Um, and like I'm saying, I don't always get it right. I think it's not always perfect. But um, if you keep on hearing the same thing over and over and over again, then you have to stop. You have to ask yourself, why does this issue keep on coming up, okay. right? Yeah. So if, if, if your members of staff keep on talking about workloads, mm -hmm. workload management, yes. right? Yes then at some point you have to think there's something that I'm not hearing, mm -hmm. okay? So let me, look, let me talk to different voices, try and understand what the problem is. Because I see my role as a chief exec as trying to understand what the whole picture is yeah. in the organization. But I still have to make decisions. And sometimes those decisions can be really difficult decisions. So the way I put it in my mind is that when I'm being inclusive, I am part of the team. Okay. When okay. I'm making decisions, I have to step out. Um, and that's when it's a lonely place because there will always be somebody who is not happy with the decision. You know that. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it's, all, it's also um, the difficulty of hearing voices but, mm. um, and different points of view. But in the end, you can't agree with everyone. No. And I, and I suppose that's the great dilemma, isn't it? Yeah. But also, I just wondered... Um, just dwelling on, on your leadership of Christian Aid, I mean, um, I mean, we do staff surveys here and mm -hmm. a whole series of communications get a sense of what people feel, but um, are things perfect at Christian Aid? You, I mean, I imagine you have the same issues as us, which is there are just so many opinions on every issue. I think there, there, I think there are many opinions on so many different things. And um, uh, I think I, I would like to believe that I, I start from a point of... Uh, they, they're all coming from a good place, okay. right? Okay, that's good advice. Primarily, yes. you know, they're, they're all yes. coming from... I, I don't think... I think there are very few people in the world who get up in the morning and say, I am going to be the bad person today <laughs> in my work. Right? I think people come to work uh, and give their contributions because genuinely they want to see progress. They want to see... They, they are committed to the cause of the organisation. And in Christian aid, that's, that's one of the things that you really see. You see that people are driven by a desire to see 
um, issues of poverty, um, power, and, and voice out there tackled with, right? Um, but like I said earlier on, uh, sometimes you have to make decisions. And when you make those decisions, um, they're not going to address every single thing. But the other thing that I have learned, especially during these last sort of 18 to 24 months, is that um, don't be married to your decision as if it's, um, it's, it's undoable, <laughs> right? Yeah. Leave the possibility open that, you know, maybe you got it wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so when voices start coming back and saying to you, you made this decision, mm. this is the lived experience in the workplace following that decision. You need, I tell myself and I tell my team, let's start listing those so that we see whether actually it's having a negative impact, okay. right? Yes. And then be prepared to change, Yeah. Sure. you know? Sure. So I, I compl my approach is I refuse to believe that everything, there's anything that's really stuck in stone okay. that you cannot yes. change. Because if yes. you made the decision in the first place, you can unmake it, unmake it. if yeah. it's not yeah. working, right? Yeah. Um, and, and I hope that, um, because we work with the vulnerable people mm. in humanitarian situations, you know. So I'll, I'll give you a quick example, mm. and, then I, and then I'll shut up. No, it's fascinating. You don't yeah. have to shut up at all. <laughs> no. You're not allowed to shut up. Yeah. So um, I was uh, uh, in Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh. It's a refugee camp, right? This is where the Rohingya, the Rohingya mm. people are, and um, we wanted to be able to get feedback from uh, from the refugees, right? Uh, on whether what we were giving was uh, appropriate, it was right. And we also wanted to get to know whether um, there were experience, there was any complaints. Did they want to report anything, any abuse? And um, you put a post box, right? And then you get feedback that actually not everybody can read and write. Yeah, which, which means what, that you what can think about. You know, yeah, why don't yeah, you even yeah. think about it? So you, you have that. So, you know, you go back and you redo that mm. and you come up with something else that works. And that's the reality. And so for me, I truly believe that, um, I think sometimes much to the nervousness of my directors, to be honest. I was going to say, I'm, I'm trying to imagine what it's like working for you, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, you know, there are times when I say, you know, I want to keep an eye on this decision and how it's landing and how people are experiencing it. Um, I How think people are experiencing now that's a very interesting way of putting it yes yes rather than it being you know there's nothing worse than a perfect plan because actually it hits reality and then you discover fatal flaws yeah, what, can I, can yeah. I ask a, 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 a question from for, as we're talking about organizations this is another question from the public this is um, from Vajira and she asked this question um, and uh, this is a common theme that uh, mm -hmm. people often ask um, I'm a member of a group promoting diversity and social inclusion in an organization which is predominantly white. What would you say would be the most useful method? Wow. Um, am I allowed to say I don't know? You are allowed to say. <laughs> OK. Um, I mean, I would have to know that um, organization specifically, because I think every organization is different and is unique. Uh, I know that what we've done in Christian Aid, mm. uh, which um, if you look at our London office, uh, it is predominantly white. Um, and uh, what we've done is we've just agreed to have some authentic, honest conversations, right? And um, again, it's that situation where you hear one, two, three people say, this is my lived experience. And you think to yourself, okay, um, how common is this, right? And, um, and you decide to, to do something about it. And, um, and in our case, we, we had a review that was done. Um, and uh, and I, I was very clear that I wanted a review that was going to touch on a number of things. Because on the one hand, you can look at issues of policies. Do you have the right policies in place? Do you have the right systems in yeah. place? You know, do you have the data that you need? And, and it's, a, it's easy to tick the box on those things. That's such a fascinating comment, because yeah. I feel so many of us are in that trap. Yeah. But I then say to the consultants, actually, I would like you to tell me the lived experiences of people. So I'm big on lived experiences, mm. because I think that, you know, you can have a 
perfect policy, yeah. but how it translates uh, when it hits the ground, when it hits people's lives, yeah. um, their experiences could be quite negative, right? And I wanted to hear what were those lived experiences? And, um, and the picture that came back was um, difficult to swallow. Yeah. But I think that, you know, as an organization, our willingness to, to confront difficult issues is incredible. Yeah. And I think maybe because we work on issues of power, we are forever challenging, yes. um, you know, governments and multilaterals and the private sector and others. And so uh, we have to be honest with ourselves and be able to challenge ourselves. And so that's the journey that we've taken. So I think my response would be um, have honest conversations of what the problem is, right? Um, and, um, you know, one thing I hope that my book also, that comes through in my book, is um, the conversation around diversity, around race, has become so polarized that uh, it's almost like there are only two sides. You're either the accused <laughs> or the accuser or the victim Absolutely. or the guilty. Yeah. And yet, um, one of the things that I continuously say to my colleagues in Christian Aid is that there's only one side. Mm, yeah. Right? We are on the same side. And uh, we have, so, so if this is a boat mm. on the river or on the seas, and there's a hole in one, on one side, we are all on the same boat, so let's fix it, right? Well, there's some beautiful phrases you use in the book on that, on that theme to try and, try and, I suppose what I'm trying to get at is there's, there's some sort of profound provocation in your book. Yes. Because one of the, the, the phrases you use quite a lot is at homeness, okay? Mm -hmm. the, the sense that actually people feeling that they belong. Yeah. Um, and that is something that sort of um, transcends some of the diversity conversations because I suppose what worries me is that a lot of the debate at the moment has become very passionate, very ardent, but going back to a word you used earlier, which I use a lot to my colleagues, when we have a big debate about things, mm -hmm. I say, but at the end of it, the key question mm -hmm. for me is, what's the progress going yeah. to be? And I, it seems to me that's one of the things that you constantly come back to in the book, which is finding a way of dealing with some quite deep emotional issues, but also finding a practical way forward. I think so. I, th I think we have to. I, I don't think we, we have a choice. Mm. I think um, the status quo cannot continue as it is, right? Um, I, I think when, you, when you're talking about emotions that run deep, right? So what I'm not saying is that um, the whole uh, conversation around institutional racism does not exist. I think it's there and it's very alive, yeah. right? And it's real. Um, when you see thousands of people leave their homes during a pandemic to go out onto the streets and say, this must stop, it must, must you, you need to ask yourself some questions. What's happening here? What's going on? Um, when you read statistics that tell you that, you know, uh, black kids uh, remain in care because they cannot be adopted, mm -hmm. right? And um, when you see the statistics that we're talking about in terms of Green Park, yeah, yeah. right? Um, yeah. You have to ask yourself, what's going on, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that reality, I think, is really important. Uh, se second thing that I want to say is that uh, I'm also not saying that the emotions of people who've who have gone through that lived experience should be refuted. Yeah, I understand. You know, yeah, uh, yeah. When, when somebody says, when somebody describes the angry black woman, I say, yes, I've got actually, I'm entitled to be angry. <laughs> That's okay? a good answer. I am absolutely yes. entitled yeah. to be livid, okay? Because I bear the, the burden of so many generations of oppression. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So That's where I'm from, that's where I'm coming from, right? But in terms of where we are going, yes, right? Uh, so notice that I'm saying that's where I'm coming from, but where we are going, because where we're going, we need to go together. Yeah, that seems to right? me the most inspiring message in the book, which yeah. is you set out very calmly your own mm -hmm. experiences, 
But um, I, mean, I read many books which are polemics, yeah. but actually there's no, none of that tone. Um, just, um, I want to come to a, a final question, which is enormous question. It's not mine, it's from the mm -hmm. public. Um, and, and you do touch on this at various points in the book, so forgive me, because you'll probably think, how can you answer this in a few minutes? But it's a great question. Um, so here we go. This is from someone called Michael, and he asks this. Can we achieve true diversity under a capitalist society? Oh. Or is a bigger societal shift needed to achieve this? Now, you have something epic here because you also have a global perspective. So rather than a yes or no answer, or maybe the answer is that simple, what's your view of that sweeping grand question? Uh, what was his name? Or her Michael, name? I'm not, Michael. Well, you, want, you want to phone him up? And <laughs> I, I probably do, you know. I, I suspect that that's another book. Um, but, well, write it then, Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think that there's something that, uh, that Michael is saying there. I think that's really um, profound. And I've just started reading another book um, by Mark Carney. Uh, the oh, yes, yes. yes, yes. Uh, it's called Value, Values. Okay. Yeah. Um, very interesting because I think that um, I haven't finished it, so I can't talk about the whole book, but uh, he begins to address some of those questions around capitalism, mm -hmm. right? Now, from my book and from my perspective, right, capitalism, racism um, are very closely okay. intertwined, okay? Because the commodification of a human being okay. as a yeah. product yeah. to be traded yeah. on the marketplace is a capitalist mm -hmm. idea. Right. Okay? And um, it just evolves and takes on a different shape and a different uh, tone and nature mm -hmm. over generations. So, you know, you can go from slavery uh, to colonialism, and now, you know, it takes, um, it, it takes a shape and a form that's more acceptable to that generation, yeah. right? So, um, can we ever eradicate racism? I don't think so. But what we want to be able to create is a group, we want people who are conscious about, about okay. what racism okay. is. We want people who are intolerant of racism that whenever they see it, they'll call it out and they'll try to do something about it, okay. right? Yeah. That, that's what yeah. we want. Are we ever going to stop people abusing others? We're probably not going to stop them. But what we want, we want a society that says no to that. So when they see it, they nip it in the bud. Yeah, I right? understand. And, and I think that's, that's, that's where we're going. I think capitalism in itself um, has become very problematic for us, or perhaps it has always been problematic. Because when I, when I rise up into the global space, what I see is um, uh, a system, an economic system, uh, that's keeping people poor. Yeah, yeah. That's keeping people in a, in a class system. Um, that's keeping people oppressed mm -hmm. um, and serving a few, um, sure, sure. you know, in, in terms of wealth. Uh, climate change is also part of that particular um, conversation. So maybe my, my, my short answer is, um, I think that, you know, to dismantle one, we have to dismantle the I other. Understand. Wow, that was a powerful, I'm glad I asked you that question. Okay. Um, there's so much to take in in what you've just said, unfortunately. Well, I had 10 minutes with you on the radio and I have a whole hour with you uh, here, but unfortunately our hour has flown by. Oh, no, so no, no, I'm just starting. I just started, <laughs> I know, exactly, exactly. I, I could talk to you for many hours and it's so wonderful to have met you actually. This is the great thing. Um, being director of a great museum does give one power and it means I can phone you up and, yes. and, know, and know you, which is wonderful. So Amanda, thank you so much for, first of all, writing such a wonderful poetic book mm -hmm. is the way I would describe it. I hope you and I stay in touch um, and maybe we'll do some more things together. And, and um, uh, as I say to those who are watching tonight, you have to read this book thank because you actually so it's much. beautiful, if I may say so. So thank you again. And now I'm going to hand over to Sarita to close our evening. Thank you to Sir Ian and Amanda Cozy-McQuashie. 
I'm sure you'll agree that that was a fascinating discussion. Do keep an eye on our website for more upcoming Open Talk events, which will be announced later in the year. You can also sign up to our newsletter to receive updates on all of our events. You can find out more about the Science Museum Group's commitment to ensure that our museums are open for all by following the link to our Open For All blog in the description below. And you can catch up on previous Open Talk events at the Science Museum YouTube channel. Finally, I'd like to mention our next online event, the latest in our very popular Global Climate Talk series, coming up on Thursday, the 29th of April, a panel discussion chaired by journalist and broadcaster Anushka Astana with a panel of brilliant climate scientists and campaigners exploring the devastating impacts of climate change right now and the risks posed by further increases in global temperature. Book your free ticket also by following the link in the description below. That's all from me. Once again, thank you to Amanda, thank you to Sir Ian, and thanks to all of you for joining us. Good evening.